There we go. <laughs> They're giving me a little box to stand on behind here because I'm so short. <laughs> and I have never felt as tall in my life. I can't believe this is what tall people feel like. I can see you all. <laughs> um, cool. Welcome. My name is Michelle Sanford. I am a TEDx speaker, a tech girl superhero, one of MCV's 30 most influential women in games. I'm the vice chair with the Australian Computer Society in WA, and I work for Microsoft. <laughs> is that an impressive introduction? <laughs> what I recommend is that all of you try and think of the top three things that you have about yourselves that you're most proud of and you know practice that kind of introduction in the mirror each morning because I didn't used to have anything like that and when I would try and do networking stuff I would just stand there awkwardly with an empty head whereas now I have this default script that can at least launch into that and it's kind of uh, what they call an elevator pitch mm -hmm. so yeah it makes things less awkward when you are uncomfortable in large numbers of people. <laughs> okay, so on the topic of being able to stand out from the crowd, here's what I'm going to try and help you with today. So in 2016, there were over 4,000 games that were released on Steam. As Steam doesn't let you release games at the weekend, that's still true, isn't it? Yeah? Um, that means there's 16 games launching every day. Uh, and so if you were releasing a game on Steam, what would you do in order to make yourself stand out from the 15 other games that were releasing on the same day as you? And I am going to talk about the ripple effect and talk about how even if you do not have a massive social media presence yourself right now, in fact, even if you never have one, if you have a little bit of one, the effects of that can ripple outwards such that it can be a lot more powerful than it would be otherwise. So uh, how many people here would say they have less than a few hundred Twitter or Instagram followers? And cool. <laughs> how many would say they have between 3,000 and 10,000? <laughs> there are people in the room that are impressive. You should mark those people. Put your hands up. Put them up. <laughs> because you should ask these people what they're doing. Uh, 3,000 is a magic number. If we have time, I'll come back to that later. If we don't, I'll have to tweet about it. So, <laughs> is there any of you not on Twitter? <laughs> I recommend signing up because during this presentation, um, I will tweet out bonus material to you because I don't have enough time to go through everything I want to cover. And you'll notice that by the fact that I will start speaking really quick when the girl at the back reminds me that I've already used up my, my, my time. Um, so I have already pre-prepared some tweets that are going out with some material which will go into more depth about what I'm talking about. Uh, okay. So I didn't really realize quite how powerful social media was until recently. I've always loved it. I've always loved LinkedIn and I've always loved Twitter, um, Facebook, you know, for like keeping in touch with friends and family or whatever. Um, and Snapchat, I didn't understand at all. And visual, I mostly took pictures of surfers at the beach. <laughs> um, but then someone contacted me within Microsoft and let me know that I was the number one social seller in Microsoft Australia. That means that I have the most influence in Microsoft Australia on LinkedIn. And I was number two in the world, which was astounding to me because I have about, I had about two and a half thousand followers on LinkedIn. So it's not a massive number, um, considering I've been working in the industry for 20 plus years. So I'm going to share what I'm going to share a little bit about a few of the social medias, not just LinkedIn, because this isn't a Microsoft sponsored talk. So therefore, I'm going to talk about <laughs> the other ones as well, which is why the talk um, has a lot of information to cram in. And I might start talking really quick. So what LinkedIn gives you is it establishes credibility from a distance 
um, influence by volume and access all areas. So the first tweet that's going out about now <laughs> has an article more in depth on how it does that. Um, but what it is, is if you are quite, if you do find it really difficult to approach people in person at conferences or, you know, in offices or whatever it is, um, you can already establish your credibility by writing stuff on LinkedIn. You don't need to go up to them and try and stumble over your elevator pitch. You can start writing stuff. Uh, what I did when I discovered I was number two in the world, um, by the way, I'm now number one in the world, <laughs> because of this. So Fabio was number two. Fabio's Italian, and he's the head of services in Microsoft in Italy. Um, he has nearly 40,000 followers. In fact, he has more than 40,000 followers now. And yet, me with my 3,000 followers, I'm still beating him in terms of influence because my network is sharing my stuff. So although he has 40,000 followers, they are not all active. They are not all actively liking his stuff, commenting on his stuff, and sharing it. And therefore, the ripples of his stuff are not going as far as mine. So if you have 3,000 followers, or you have 40,000 followers, or you have 300 followers, or you have 20, it doesn't matter if your network is actively engaged with you, because your 20 followers, if they are really engaged with you, they will um, spread it outwards. And their followers, they might have 3,000 or 40,000, will spread it outwards. So there's no need to be discouraged or disheartened by how many you do or do not have. I do, I do write a lot of articles on LinkedIn. And the reason I write a lot of articles is because uh, if you do not write, if you do not put yourself out there, then people will not follow you. It's okay to talk to them, but you have to let them know what your ideas are. You have to risk that someone's going to say that was that stupid, what you think, bearing in mind that most of the people won't. Most of the people will say, that's good, I like that article, and they will share it. So don't be afraid. I think a lot of people are afraid that the internet will attack them, turn on them, ravage them, and then spit them out. That doesn't happen as often as, as it says on the internet. So, you know, don't let that stop you. Um, I do, a lot of people say to me that they don't have time to do as much as I do on social media. I would say I don't have as much time as to do as much as Liam does on social media, but I have enough for me because all I do is I go to events, I take a picture, and then I write a little bit about what I love about that event or wherever I am. And in every day, I look for something that I like or is interesting. And I mostly put the picture up, write that one paragraph while I'm walking between meetings. So it's not really taking that much time. The other things I'm doing is I'm commenting on people's posts and liking them. And I do that as well when I'm walking up and down the, the terrace in Perth. So it's not really taking up a lot of time. It's just a little bit consistently and often. Um, one thing I do, which I think is super useful, before I come to a conference, I will do this. I will pick out a bunch of speakers that I think are interesting, that I want to go and see. I'll make a little picture of them. And I will talk about how I'm going to that conference, how I can't wait to meet those speakers. I then tag them in, and I'll tag, maybe tag their companies, tag my company, tag the conference. This is, social media is kind of like a, a technical representation of karma. So you are giving people kudos, and they will thank you for that by sharing that post, by liking that post, and then it will ripple out to their networks. Conference speakers generally have huge networks because they're speakers, so they're already influential. So your word will spread further, and a lot of people might follow you as a result of that. Those people, I then ask them all for a connection, and they will all connect to me because I've done something good to them. And why wouldn't you pay someone back when they've done something good to you? So it's a good way to engage with people in advance of the conference. And that was really great at NDC. I didn't have to queue to speak to the speakers. They all went for coffee with me. So that was awesome. Um, the other things that people like are, they want it to be stuff that's interesting to you. So don't be trying really hard to think, what can I possibly write about? Something that's interesting to you is what people want to read about. 
So here it's like Microsoft, it's uh, women in tech, it's games. And if you, I don't know whether, you, oh, can you see that? That was like 8,000 views, the Microsoft one, 2,000 views, the uh, Unite one, and 4,000 views, the one where I'm writing about a game. I only did those, those last two at the weekend. So that's like a very quickly that they've got a lot of response. Uh, this one with Jason holding his baby, that one has 37,000 views. <laughs> because people like to have a sneak peek into the lives of your company. So even if you're a tiny indie, people want to know what it is like to work at a tiny indie. They want a picture of what it's like working there. And even if that's you working in your living room and making your game with cats and kids climbing all over you, <laughs> that's interesting to them, more interesting than the one about Satch's book, which was still pretty interesting, actually. But Jason also um, published a picture of himself holding his baby at Microsoft. It didn't get as many views, and I think the reason is because he stood and posed by a Surface device. People don't want posed. People just want natural. They want to see you really at work, and that, you know, he looks like he's kind of, he's not smiling or anything. He's on the phone holding a baby. He looks like he's struggling a little bit. People want to see that. So yeah, that's the summary. Just just do often, a little bit often. Give people a sneak peek into, into your lives and be authentic to what you care about. Twitter. So Twitter is the thing that enables you at conferences and between conferences. So where I'm sending out the tweets during this session, that enables me to not worry about whether I'm going to get through all my content because I know that you can get my content afterwards uh, because I've tweeted it all out. Um, these two, Lindy Stevens and Sam Newman, used to work for ThoughtWorks, which is one of the coolest developer software companies in the world. And I follow those companies and I follow people that work at those companies. I really like this one because they called themselves thought workers when you, when you work at ThoughtWorks. Lindy was the global people manager and I was following her and I noticed she was coming to Perth to speak at a free conference. So I tweeted to her and said, oh, I'm really excited, I'm coming to see you. And if we're in America, that would maybe get lost amongst the billions of tweets they have over there. But in Australia, not everyone is using it. In Perth, even less. <laughs> and so when I tweeted to her that, she got that tweet and she replied to me and says, oh yeah, that's cool. Let's meet afterwards for a glass of wine. So we met afterwards for a glass of wine and we've been really good friends ever since. I've been to the ThoughtWorks office in Sydney. Again, when I was coming to Sydney, I just tweeted her and said I was coming here and she invited me over. And there I met Sam, who's now her husband. And then recently for GDC, uh, G, no, NDC, he messaged me on LinkedIn and said, because he's living in England now, they both are. He said, uh, do you want to meet up for coffee? So he messaged me over LinkedIn, do you want to meet up for coffee? And when I told a guy in my office that I was coming to NDC, he said, oh, do you know what? You should really try and, and meet Sam Newman if you can. He's just like a god. And I was like, oh, actually, Sam just messaged me and we're meeting for coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's Twitter and social media that enables those relationships. I've met them, Lindy and Sam. Sam twice in real life, Lindy maybe four times in real life but we are all really good friends because Twitter enables that relationship in between. So, you know, you only have to, in a global world, you only have to see each other once a year at a big conference, but the next time you see them, because you've tweeted a few times during the year, followed their stuff, retweeted it, they know who you are, kept you in mind. Those ripples are all there and they will link you together. That's not a perfect um, example. <laughs> Ripples don't link you together, but you know what I mean. So here's some here's some people who are heavy hitters in Twitter. So Liam has got over five thousand followers there. Uh, Giselle's got over six thousand. Uh, Jennifer has got over six thousand, nearly seven. Um, Jennifer Shell, she has fourteen and a half thousand. That's insane. But you know she's quite international, so you know. Uh, but Ninjaska, who's like a ninja and a Jessica, <laughs> is 
is only from Perth and she's got over 5,000. So it's entirely pos possible, even if you are living in a small town on the edge of the world, Twitter doesn't care, it will enable you regardless. And then Robin, I put up there because she has got a cool game, Luna Out, which we were playing at Unite. Oh, very meditative, much like the Stir Fire game. Uh, yeah, but she's American. Okay, so Twitter, conversation equals engagement. This is why I say I can't keep up with Liam because he's like a crazy man. Like all of the tweets and then he's just replying to them and he's having conversations and apparently Ninjaska is doing the same and people like and follow people who are talking to them. So it's a very personal tool that is completely impersonal. So it's, it's absolutely public but and transparent. Has anyone seen the circle? If, yeah, <laughs> if you haven't seen it, definitely see it. That is a thought-provoking film, and it's not even the future. That's definitely this now. Uh, anyway, transparent, public conversations, but one-on-one -on -one that anyone can read. That's people like that. Authenticity, honesty, openness, and engagement. Um, hashtags. <laughs> hashtags are super important, so apparently you can get two times more engagement with hashtags. This is uh, Susan Boyle. She uh, used this unfortunate hashtag for um, Susan Album Party. It did get a lot of coverage for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what this is, FF? Anyone? Follow Friday, right. So Follow Friday is another epitome of karma on the internet. In the on Friday, you use the hashtag FF or uh, Follow Friday, and you put a bunch of cool people's Twitter tags in there. Um, this is social currency. This is a good thing to do because um, all of those people are super cool, and by me tweeting about them and saying these are cool people to follow, um, that links me to their coolness, which is awesome. Um, and hopefully they would be grateful for me uh, spruiking them a little bit and they would also do the same for me or at least retweet it and then I would get more followers as a result. Um, so do this for each other, do this for your community and when you see people do it for you, spread the love. Uh, you can ask for a retweet, so please RT, you can, you can ask for that and apparently you will get four times more engagement when someone retweets because of course when someone retweets that then goes to all of their followers as well, so not just your followers but their followers and if some of their followers retweet that goes to their followers as well and this is how you can get the, the ripples of engagement through the network. This is interesting to me in that she has 238 likes on a tweet. I don't think I've ever had that many ever. <laughs> but only two retweets. To, to me, it would, be, it would be better for the network, for you, for everyone, if you retweeted, because then that goes to all of your followers and everything like that. Whereas the, the likes, that's not as obvious. And so I don't know why people would just like something and not retweet it. But I think most likely in this case, um, it's because there's no, there's no question there and there's no value to be added on. So people are looking for value in your tweet. They're looking for something more social currency to share. So, you know, try to make not all of your tweets because people love selfies. <laughs> But, you know, try and give people something that they want to pass forward. Like, you know, that your game is on special this week. Um, this is what I'm using. I'm using Hootsuite to send out the um, auto-tweets. So everything that's tweeted by me during this session, obviously I'm not tweeting it, but they're going out magically using Hootsuite. You can use Buffer and there's a few other tools as well that you could also use. Uh, so, Twitter summary, conversation, reach out and embrace the hashtag. Cheeky hashtag, maybe. <laughs> Instagram. Now, I super, super, super love Instagram because I'm a very visual person. Is anyone else visual, prefers pictures to anything else? Yeah, good. Um, however, my love of Instagram does not prove I know anything about it. I'll tell you, I'll show you why in a minute. 
This is a uh, Nintendo and Vans uh, shared ad. This is good. This is really good because it's creative content about their brand, but it isn't like overly salesy. It's not like, here's a shoe, buy it. Or, you know, here's a, here's a Nintendo console, buy it. It's, it's a shoe in obviously a, well, probably a Nintendo kind of um, pixel thing. Um, and it's clever. People want to share that. People want to like that. People want to engage with that. And so when you're thinking about your game studios, think about, you know, how can you do stuff cleverly? So this is another great example. These guys were um, excellent in their marketing pre-game. Um, this was for uh, No Man's Sky. <laughs> so they made like a little weather uh, looking app, mocked up a weather app to talk about what it's like on 502 degrees and sunny in that planet, which is really, really clever. Um, creating a lot of buzz around the game in, in advance. Okay, this is why I say, although I love it, I can't, I don't know anything, because there's Nazy, she has uh, 8,000 followers, Geek, Geek uh, Gamer Girl has 6,000, Coda Girl has 12.1 thousand, and I have 300. And through this entire process where I have been studying what these people have been doing and reading books and everything, I still have 300. So it goes up to like 320 and then it goes down again. Oh, I should have said on LinkedIn, you never lose followers. People do not unfollow you on LinkedIn, <laughs> but on Instagram, they do. Um, and if you don't want to buy followers and you don't want to follow a bunch of you know, people selling to you, then I'm not, I don't know. I do not know how to get them up there. So if someone knows this, then definitely tweet that information to me because <laughs> I don't know. But I'm going to show you some beautiful stuff anyway. And what they say is the thing to do. So they say you want to stay focused on your brand. So here, um, Geek Girl Academy, Girl Geek Academy, I should say. They, they like girls, they like geeks, they like coding, they like computers. And it's all sort of purpley pink stuff. Um, this is Hello Miss Potter, um, and she's, you know, she's very true to who she is. She likes selfies, she's cute animals, food, games, and purple, always purple. Um, consistent colour schemes are very popular, and so um, there's a lot of people that do everything completely on brand, keeping the colour and uh, matching it all the way through. Um, oh, this is me. See. There is nothing, <laughs> there is nothing wrong with these beautiful pictures. These look just as good as theirs, but nevertheless, only 300. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, mix business with pleasure, as I was saying on LinkedIn. I think that's cool. And other people are doing it too. So this is um, GitHub and Atlassian. And yeah, I love that because it's kind of like a sneak peek into their offices and their worlds. It's colorful, it's computers, it's tech, it's, yeah, it's cool. Uh, be a people person, so people like people. That's who people follow. They don't really follow the brands, they follow the people. Put yourself in the picture. That one with the Xbox controller and the feet, that is a really popular pose on Instagram. People love to just put their feet in the picture. And um, yeah, apparently it gives it some humanity. <laughs> uh, unleash your inner weirdo. So yeah, you don't need to hold back on the internet. The internet embraces you for who you are and it enjoys you. So uh, yeah, look, you see um, a paradigm game there. He has double the number of followers I am and he's doubly weird. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't checked out Jacob's game, you should because it's really cool. Okay, so be creative, mix business with pleasure and be a people person. Do you know about this game? So this is an interesting one in that on Kickstarter, they raised only, well, they would have raised only $12,800 of their $100,000 goal. I think a lot of people have this experience of Kickstarter. Um, nothing wrong with Kickstarter, of course. It's just that for some reason, not everyone always buys your game. So they decided to go another way. So what they did was they went to a publisher called Tiny Build and they sent it a demo version of Hello Neighbor. 
and it sent that demo version to several thousand popular creators on YouTube and Twitch and invited them to make videos of themselves playing the game. Um, if, they, if the viewers liked the game, they could get a demo of the game for free. Within a month of showing it on YouTube and Twitch, Hello Neighbor had earned back its budget through pre-orders and has since more than tripled that number. The final version of the game isn't on sale yet, but I think it's coming out towards the end of the year. Is that right? No one has the game, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was an extremely, extremely uh, good way to get it all the way out there. The reason I said 3,000 was a magic number before is because they say that influencers who have between 3,000 and 10,000 followers are more useful than ones that have hundreds of thousands or millions of followers. The reason being like Kim Kardashian or whatever, people like to look at her, but they are not really engaging massively. The return on investment as well, so paying for a single Instagram post or video or something like that with Kim Kardashian is, I don't know, millions, hundreds of thousands, it's a lot. Whereas you can play someone who is an influencer of between 3,000 and 10,000 followers, you can pay them like $500 for one post. $500 for one post sounds like a good way to make some extra money for your studio, does it not? <laughs> and it's, uh, it's quite within reach. And yeah. People should not ring me ever. They should only ever tweet me or message me. <laughs> Um, yeah, okay, cool. The one, the one caveat around that is do not, do not give people the whole game to let them play it early. When you give them the whole game to, play, to have them play it early, especially if it's a narrative game, if they play the whole game through on YouTube, then people don't buy your, your game because they already know what happens. They already seen the whole playthrough and there's a lot of people that just, you know, are interested in, in that. So, you know, just give them the demo, that's it. And yeah, maybe kind of like release chapters a bit at a time and then so you're always keeping them in suspense. Okay, Snapchat. Now, initially I did not really have that much to say about chat, Snapchat because I was completely baffled by it. It's like a thing that only the kids use, I thought. Um, is anyone using Snapchat in here? Oh, look, are you all kids, though? <laughs> not you. You're not, no. <laughs> um, but I persevered with it, and the more I've been using it, the more I do see that there is likely a very good brand advantage in Snapchat. Um, initially, all I was doing pretty much was... Um, taking pictures of me in rabbit ears and sending them to like my one friend <laughs> and then and then he would send those he would send a funny picture back and that was pretty much all we were doing um but the more i have used it the more i've looked at it the more i think there is something here uh limited attention span is something i understand the whole world has a limited attention span now you used to be able to sit still throughout a whole session and give 100% of your attention to it. During this session, some people have left. That's because obviously they're bored. <laughs> and uh, that's because it's too long. Because in fact, the maximum they say now that anyone will give their attention to anything is six minutes. Um, and if you have something, if you have a piece of content that is available for much less than six minutes, you are much likely to have people's attention for that amount of time. Snapchat, like it's, it's seconds. Um, you can set the sort of dial as to how long it will be, but it's seconds. And indeed, when a, a little Snapchat comes in, people will always open it and they will always watch it because it's only six seconds or four seconds or whatever, and then it's gone. And then they wish it wasn't gone. <laughs> So yeah, it's a way to sort of um, grab their attention for, for just a little while. <laughs> uh, they have a lot of crazy things. <laughs> and then it's gone, yeah. So it's kind of, there's 
like meaningless stuff, embarrassing stuff, private stuff, silly stuff. Um, and, you know, then they just disappear and then they're gone. This is one of the things I really like, and this was the thing that really gave it its advantage initially. I say initially because now you can also do the stories feature using Instagram and using Facebook, so it no longer has that just to itself. What it does have is those little ears that I'm wearing. <laughs> you know, it, auto it filters you and makes you look pretty. And then it puts ears on my head, which makes my hair sort of look better than it does normally. So therefore, you can have the picture and write the story, and you add these things to a story, and um, you, can, you can add a lot of them, and then, um, but they only last for 24 hours, those stories. So people can watch them, but then they will disappear. So that, that limited time only thing also captures their imagination. Now, I'm sure you can see why I'm going in, in terms of a, a brand perspective there as well. So the founder of Snapchat, well, this is, I took this picture from my bed in the dark yesterday morning when I had to get up. Um, well, that, you know, that creature's like a little thing that you can overlay. He's not really in my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> But um, it, it gives you it gives you this this insight into people's intimate lives. You know, I would probably wouldn't normally be taking pictures of my bedroom in the dark or anything. But it's it's there for like a few seconds. So you know, whatever. <laughs> I'm not naked in it, but you know, people sometimes are. <laughs> um, and yeah, that that visual communication thing. They say 93% of communication is all nonverbal, and they say that humans process visuals 60,000 times faster than text. And so if you can tell a story for your brand, for your studio with pictures, and if that, that story is disappearing, people will value it as something special, something precious, something brief. Um, so there's six surefire ways to captivate your audience using Snapchat brand specific content. So here's a bunch of Microsoft people listening to what Cortana is ordering them to do. She controls them with her blue circle. Um, behind the scenes content, promotion driven content. So imagine if you are sharing, here's our, our um, Steam code or whatever, and it's going to be gone in six seconds. People are pretty <laughs> People feel like they've got to get it quick, and they also feel like it's only coming to them because you open it like a message in your in your um, inbox kind of thing, and then it's gone. Um, and yeah, leverage the stories, and say embrace the naughty screenshot. So of course, with the naked selfies, that's where people discovered you could um, screenshot your in your um, Snapchat and therefore keep it forever. Um, and brands are leveraging that idea to say, take a, take a Snapchat of your, uh, take a screenshot of the Snapchat that we send to you and then share it on Twitter with this hashtag. And then they can sort of bring the Twitter followers over and in because of, of that kind of, you know, you've got to be quick to do it. And then you share it, you're sharing a secret and your, peop your friends, your followers can join in our secret, can join our tribe because they're your friends. So people are thirsty for transparency and they're looking for an inside look at how things are built and done within your organization. So the brands that are using Snapchat well are the ones that are showing those uh, secret inside views of their organization. You know, maybe a piece of code for the new game you've written, maybe, yeah, how your studio looks um, after you've been working all night. <laughs> but you know, it's gonna be gone very quickly. So here's like a, a little example. This isn't a real code, so. <laughs> but, you know, a, a little something, an image, and, and then a thing, and you can encourage your, your followers to um, screenshot it and then share it on, on special. It makes them feel special. Yeah, and then it's all gone, and it's all gone. So visual marketing is here to stay, whether it's Instagram or Snapchat. 
or another network that takes the crown. We can all agree that visual marketing isn't going to go anywhere soon. Um, so while the pan is, is still hot, no one's going to ignore Snapchat. If your market is young people, then it's like you can't really ignore it. And I think in games, your market is definitely young people. I mean, it's older people as well, but you can't ignore the, the young ones coming through. You want to capture their, their interest and bring them with you. And it's a different way of, of speaking. People all have their own uh, favorite social medias. Why is that a blank screen? Okay, and so I said I was going to talk about the magic, the magic numbers. Um, you all know this guy, I presume. <laughs> um, so he makes all his money being a YouTube star, just playing people's games and just <laughs> talking about stuff. These other two are friends of mine. Um, Troy Hunt, have you all heard of him? Troy Hunt is a, a big guy in security, and Lars Klint is a friend of his. Um, I, I met Lars in person at DDD Perth last year, and Lars did a really, a really um, stark lock note where he, he revealed a lot of personal information about himself to a room full of developers. And I thought this probably isn't going to be that popular because they're developers. Surely they've come here to code. But um, it was really, it was really revealing. He opened himself up, and so did they. And it was a wonderful, wonderful thing. What he said was that he decided he wasn't going to. I mean, this wasn't the only thing, but he said he wasn't going to work for a big corporation anymore. That that was not the life for him. That what he had decided to do was to do what he loved doing. And he was going to do it in the same way as his friend Troy was doing it, and uh, a lot of others like them. So he, he goes around the world, he speaks at conferences, and he gets those conferences to pay for him to come there and, and speak. He uh, writes courses and teaches them on Pluralsight. He does uh, vlogs. He does. Um, blogs, he does training, he does workshops, he does, he does all sorts of stuff, but like little things, portfolio kind of career. And a lot of people are doing that. The 3,000 follower thing is because there are companies like this one called Tribe. Has anyone heard of this? So <laughs> if you have 3,000 followers, then you can sell your content on Tribe. And when I say sell your content, I mean you you propose stuff, you put stuff up, and then people will sort of say, yeah, we'll, we'll give you $300 for, to post that thing about how Nescafe is excellent or whatever. But you know, it's like a, it's a cup of coffee. And it's not like, it's not like you can't say, I'm being paid for this post. You can, you know, you should absolutely be absolutely authentic to your followers. But it's a really good way to get extra money. I think, were I an indie studio, I would always be thinking, what are the extra revenue streams that I could be getting? And the coincidental thing is that all these additional revenue streams ripple out and add to your influence. So the more stuff, more you get paid for good content. And when you are incentivized to get paid for content, you put good content out there. Um, Yeah, I don't. I, I have 3,000 on LinkedIn and nearly on Twitter, but that's not really the goal for me because I just want to post pictures. So, really, I've only got 300 on Instagram and I'm a long way from that. So, if you are all on Instagram and could just follow me, that would really help me out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so actually, I have done really well and uh, come to the end, and I didn't think I was going to. So, does anyone have any questions? Yes. What's your take on the announcement that Facebook might not be showing business posts as often and um, making it so that you actually have to pay for those posts to be seen? Do you not have much impact on Facebook? Yeah, so my friend Ming, uh, Empress Ming, I call her, <laughs> she's a, a social media and marketing guru, and most of her stuff is around Facebook. So. If, if she had been doing this session, it would absolutely have all been on Facebook with a little bit on, on the other things. Whereas I use it less for, well, less than the other ones. 
Um, she's, she says it's the future. Yeah, I don't know, because it's very hard for... Because there are pages, there are business pages, there are, are personal pages and things like that. I think it's very hard in, in a blended world for them to be able to differentiate between what really is a business post. My, who I am online is who I am in real life. And am I Michelle from Microsoft or am I Michelle the tech girl superhero or am I something else? I don't know. I'm, I'm a combination of all of those things and they're blended. And so I think if they make business posts such that you have to pay for those specifically, people will stop using that explicit thing and they will use their own personal persona and talk about business like I talk about business as if it is fully integrated into your life. And that is... That is the dream that we're all looking for, isn't it? That what you do and who you are are all one thing and you're enjoying every minute of it. <laughs> yeah? What do you, have you ever had to distance, uh, distance yourself from uh, corporations that you're engaged with? So let's say you would leave Microsoft for some reason or, or you want to distance away from that. Would your brand have you coupled with that? Uh, so, yeah, so Microsoft doesn't ever tell me what I can or cannot say, which is one of the reasons why I would find it very difficult to leave Microsoft, <laughs> because I think not every corporation gives you the kind of freedom that I have. Um, I don't know, there's, there's another big um, competitor of ours that is often reaching out inquiries to me and I think it's one of the reasons that that I'm I don't I don't look into that because yeah I don't want to be part of something that tells me who I can or cannot be I want to be who I am all the time and I will help their brand with my own brand and vice versa because I, I you know you, sh you should be fully fully authentic to who you are and the company you work for you should believe in them and you should you know as long as it's all true it's like with the the paid posts as well like you shouldn't be advertising something that you don't believe in that you aren't true to if if they ever said to me if they had like a whole new culture change and they said that's it you need to tow the company line I would immediately leave it's as simple as that and the, the life that I'm trying to set up for myself, like Troy, like Lars, like Oren, like loads of my friends, is make it so that if someone tells you you cannot work here anymore, you're not, you're not crippled by that. You're not, you know, it, it shouldn't be, you shouldn't be working at an organization with golden handcuffs on or any other kind. Well, you know, unless you enjoy that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bit rambly. Is is that is that okay or, or is yeah? <laughs> is anyone else? Yeah. I think it's the same. I think if you if you where you try and separate it out, it isn't as good. Where a, a brand itself isn't linked to the people that work for it, isn't empowered by the people that make it up, that isn't as powerful a brand as it could be. You know, if if they set culture at the top and everyone within that company has the same kind of um, outlook. That makes it sound very non-diverse, but I just mean, you know, if you're, <laughs> if you're um, very open mindset at your company, uh, then they should embrace that and they should let people talk about it in their own way. And then it will have a much wider, well, ripple effect because the things, the things that I post, I do not have, when I post things about tech, about hardcore tech, 
I don't get a huge amount of engagement on that because people do not want to hear me talking about actual hardcore tech. They, they want me to talk about STEM. They want me to talk about kids playing games. They don't mind me talking about indie community um, and women, diversity, accessibility, all of those things. But if I try to talk about, I don't know, open source on Azure, it gets very few likes. Whereas uh, my friend Jonathan Wade, when he's talking about that, he's getting thousands of views because that is what they associate with his personal brand. And so if you want to hit your whole market, you need to have a lot of people and they need to be talking about what really matters to them because that's what people will engage with. They can tell when you're not authentic, when you're not excited, when you don't love it. Yeah? See, I would really love to do Twitch and YouTube, apart from the fact that I'm really camera shy. <laughs> and um, I, yeah, I think, it's an, I think it's an awesome platform and you see people like Nazi um, making a career, launching a career from there, you know, using that as their main platform. And that's why I say, yeah, let the people within your organization, within your team, choose which things they like and play to their strengths within it because you can't capture all of the market and yes, you're using all of the tools and all of the tools are available free or, you know, well, even, like even LinkedIn where there is a paid version, I would say there is no need to use the paid version. I never use the paid version until Microsoft uh, bought it and then I got it for free. <laughs> I do like it now I see it because of all the analytics and stuff but you don't need it in order to gain that level of influence and so yeah I, I think it's a, an awesome one and I could probably have stood here all day talking about all of the different ones and yeah the, yeah it's it's a it's a great one but I don't yeah I don't do it <laughs> uh anyone else am I Oh, it's, we have three minutes left, so is anyone? No? Then uh, I will, oh, wait, one more. <laughs> yeah, um, what was your, was there any strategy in picking your handles, or did you just go about and just find something that was <laughs> So I have been on those things for 20 plus years now. If I was picking today, then I would absolutely um, choose stuff that was, like more yeah more thing but in fact it's pretty it would be pretty hard for me to if I was 20 years of age or 18 or something like that you don't know who you're gonna be is there anyone that's that young who already thinks they know who they are <laughs> I think I've changed oh you know I've changed the things that are my three or four things many times in that 20 years Whereas now, I suppose I would pick something like really around tech and stuff. The Instagram one, I was, you're able to change that. Um, the Twitter one, you can change what the display is, not the, not the actual handle, I think. Um, so there is some flexibility over that. And I think that, yeah, where it allows you to do that, you should do that and associate it to to something that you think is clever and engaging and easy to remember and linked to you and all of that. But I do have a friend, we have a friend in Perth whose handle is not, I, I have nothing that links that handle to her <coughs> and her name is not in there. And so whenever I'm looking for her and haven't engaged in a while, I have to ask her remind me what is your <laughs> who am I looking for because it never says Sophie <laughs> so yeah it, related to you related to your personal brand and um yeah change it if you can and with all of the things like mix them up change your profile pictures change your headers make it fresh make it new like show people you're engaged with it and engage with them and remember yeah it's it it is a 
It is a karmic experience. Give in to the internet and it will give back to you. There may be some horrible people out there, but don't engage with those. <laughs> and when you feel sad, you can ask the internet for love and people will give it to you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for coming here today. <laughs>